right. Hello, everyone. All right, so this is the last reading that I had assigned. And uh, now will be like counted again as the uh, extra credit assignment. I'm thinking of like to have it as extra credit, it'll be that you have to have like completed like all the readings for the week in order to uh, get the grade. So if you just did one, um, I don't know. I mean, it's still up in the air. I have to decide on it eventually what it is that I'm going to do exactly. It just makes more sense to me to have it like as like per week, I guess, like uh, for the um, extra credit to be available. <clears throat> just so it'll be like a little less work on my part to have to like create all these like grades. And then for those that don't do it, you know, I don't want it to just be like a waste of time for me. <laughs> okay, so um, this last reading that we had is um, an essay, Straw into Gold, The Metamorphosis of the Everyday by Sandra Cisneros. Um, so again, I was really bummed that I couldn't cover these readings in classes with in class with you all because a lot of these readings were actually like really good. A lot of these are some of my favorite authors. I love Sandra Cisneros as well. She's a famous Mexican-American author, uh, most famous for writing the book, The House on Mango Street, which I've mentioned a few times. And if you all haven't checked it out or looked into it, it's actually a really, really good book. I think that uh, a lot of you would enjoy it. There's a lot of like the uh, Mexican culture that's really represented within the book. And it's very um, relatable. I, I think like as a uh, as Mexican Americans, it's something that we can really like connect with. So a lot of her works are uh, really like alluding to the Mexican American experience. And um, I mean, we'll, we'll get we'll get to that in a little bit. Like it, it's it's very obvious that, yeah, she's like speaking for our people. Um, so we're going to go ahead and read through the biography. Sandra Cisnero, she was born in 1954. She's still alive to this day. She lives in uh, San Antonio, I believe, actually. I'm trying to write the stories that haven't been written, Sandra Cisneros has proclaimed. With her rich, intimate por portraits of Mexican and Mexican-American characters, Cisneros hopes to make readers of all races aware of the complexities of straddling two cultures. She sees herself as a voice for the voiceless. I'm determined, she explains, to fill a literary void. So she's really concerned not only just with sort of like the Mexican experience, but the Mexican-American experience and how she's speaking to all races, not just Mexican-Americans, but everyone that uh, is within America that can identify with two different cultures or two different races. Because being that we're Mexican-Americans, we can identify a lot with the American culture, right? Uh, there's a lot of things that we have here in America that is relatable to other Americans, but we also have the Mexican part of our culture that um, makes us relatable with other Mexicans. And this is sort of like, um, I, I want to say this was kind of like touched upon in the reading that we did by Gloria Anzaldúa, uh, where it talks about sort of, you know, like these, like this uh, dual, like double identity al almost with being Mexican, but also being American. Um, so born to a Mexican father and a Mexican-American mother, uh, Cisneros grew up on Chicago's South Side, the only girl among seven children. She felt as if she had seven fathers because her brothers tried to control her behavior. Like their father, they thought Sandra should adopt a quiet, traditional lifestyle. Fortunately, she was blessed with a mother brave enough uh, to raise her daughter in a non-traditional way. My mother didn't force me to, to learn how to cook, says Cisneros, and she always told me, make sure you can take care of yourself. So she did grow up, and it's, this is very common within Mexican-American households to have sort of this like machista or um, idea about like how things are run within the household. So for her to be the only daughter and for her to have uh, six older brothers, as well as her father sort of like uh, look to her, you know, as the only girl in the family, of course, they were kind of like thinking for her to take on the more traditional uh, roles that women traditionally have within the household. But her mom was more of like a... Uh, a different type of like she was a little bit more non-traditional so she didn't have like force her to cook or clean or um do things and that she uh told her always make sure that you can take care of yourself so she did like inspire this independence within uh Cisneros with within her daughter um and I think that that's kind of where we can see her now that she's really made a name for herself as one of like the most famous uh, Mexican-American writers in uh, American literature 
Cisneros formed fast, a few lasting friendships in early childhood because her family moved frequently between Chicago and Mexico. The moving back and forth, the new school, uh, were very upsetting to me as a child, she once said. Repeating into herself, Cisneros became a keen observer of others and a secret writer of poetry. After years of clandestine com composition, she encountered a teacher in high school who appreciated her experiences and her writing. With the teacher's encouragement, Cisneros began to share her work with her classmates. In 1976, Cisneros entered the University of Iowa's prestigious Writers' Workshop, surrounded by people from more privileged backgrounds. Cisneros felt intimidated. Soon, however, she, be she, she came to realize that she could write about something her classmates could not. It was not until this moment, Cisneros recalls, when I separated myself, when I considered myself truly distinct, that my writing acquired a voice. Cisneros' realization gave rise to, rise to her acclaimed The House on Mango Street, which was published in 1984, a series of interlocking prose poems uh, about a poor Mexican-American family. Her reputation was cemented with the publication in 1991 of Woman Hollering Creek, a collection of stories and everything I've done in my life, she maintains, including all the choices I've made as a writer. I followed my gut and my heart. It's taken me where I've needed to go so far. So it does mention, of course, that uh, because she was moving a lot as a child, she never really made any like long, like lasting child uh, friendships. And because of that, she felt like she was alone. So she turned to writing sort of as like a way to like express herself. And it was like a way for her to like, uh, you know, have like a friend was through uh, paper and pen and being able to express her thoughts. And uh, after she did so much writing that, you know, there was a, a teacher that like really encouraged her and inspired her to pursue that. <laughs> and even though that when she went into like this one uh, writer's workshop that she was surrounded by a bunch of people with uh, more privileged backgrounds, meaning that they were probably a little bit more well off than her in terms of money. Uh, we can probably assume just like some like white people, maybe um, that she came to realize that she could write about something that her classmates could not. And of course, that's her experience, her culture of her being a Mexican-American, that that's something that's unique to her as a person. And that's something that she really tries to showcase within her writing. Um, so did you know that Sandra Cisneros wrote in secret as a child because she knew her family would disapprove? She won a MacArthur uh, Genius Grant, a large monetary award given to honor exceptional creativity and originality, and has had poems on display uh, on Chicago subways and buses. She's pretty famous in Chicago since that's uh, one of like where she uh, came from. And I want to say also her novel, The House on Mango Street, is actually set in Chicago, so... Um, it talked about voice and about her being able to develop her own voice. So we're going to get a little bit into that about talking about voice when it is that we read. Uh, a writer's voice is his or her, her unique style of or expression. This unique use of language is what allows you to hear a human pers personality behind the words you read. In Straw into Gold, Sandra Cisneros writes, I've never seen anybody make corn tortillas ever. The informal tone, so you can already hear like from reading this that there's like no formality about it. It's kind of she's just more saying it like in a more like talkative, conversational way. Uh, the use of a contraction, the everyday words, the short sentence uh, followed by a fragment and the pauses before and after the word ever all help create Cisneros' voice in this essay. One that is personal, relaxed and conversational. The voice is consistently natural even with this essay's central illusion, an indirect reference the author assumes her readers will recognize. The mythological story to which Cisneros alludes is similar to most children. As you read, or is familiar to most children, so we'll talk about that in a bit. As you read, look for instances when you hear Cisneros' voice uh, behind her words. Note the stylistic elements that help create this unique effect. Uh, we're also going to talk about like structure and uh, deductive and inductive reasoning a little bit. So the structure of a literary work or how its different parts are organized is directly tied to the author's purpose. Cisneros reveals two purposes in this essay and she uses two methods of reasoning, two kinds of structure to achieve them. 
Her primary structure is anecdotal. Using inductive reasoning, she shares with readers some of her formative experiences, moments that helped shape her life as a writer. Then she draws general conclusions from those specific experiences. And I want to say that I went over inductive and deductive reasoning at the beginning of the school year. So this is just sort of like to refresh your minds on that, on these terms and sort of uh, the different types of structures that are presented within this essay. At the heart of the essay, you will also find an example of deductive reasoning. The writer arrives at a conclusion by applying a general principle to a specific situation. The general principle is that weaving straw into gold reveals magical power. The specific situation is that Cisneros, in her own way, can weave straw into gold. Finally, the specific conclusion is that, as a writer, Cisneros has magical power. <clears throat> Personal essays are often loosely structured and straw into gold is no exception. Cisneros begins the essay with an anecdote, a brief story that makes a point. So as you read, use a chart like the one, well, no, we don't really normally do that, but it is just important to note that an anecdote is a brief story that makes a point. So she does introduce it with a story and that's just to uh, get the readers thinking, to get them to sort of like see from her perspective more or less what it is that she wants to talk about or bring uh, uh, as a focus within this essay. Um, so let's go ahead and actually get to the essay itself. So the essay is Straw into Gold, The Metamorphosis of the Everyday. And I just uh, sort of translated there for people that maybe if you don't really know what metamorphosis is, it's just basically like a transformation. So Straw into Gold, The Transformation of the Everyday. And it's just like basically saying making uh, the ordinary grade or making something like magical, like uh, a transformation of that, like a, making straw into gold. And she's using this illusion of a, a children's story, I want to say with a Rumpelstiltskin. Uh, and, and we'll explain it once it is that she actually sort of brings this illusion within the, the, within the work. So we'll go ahead and start reading. So the background, Cisneros originally delivered the text of Straw into Gold as a speech. The essay still retains some characteristics of an oral work. So, for example, the voice has a distinctly conversational character. The phrase straw into gold refers to the challenge faced by the heroine in Rumpelstiltskin. In this fairy tale, as you may recall, a miller's daughter was put, uh, will be put to death unless she can do the seemingly impossible, namely spin go gold out of mere straw. The word metamorphosis in the subtitle means transformation. So that more or less explains it. It's from, like I said, the the uh, one of the uh, like an, an old story from Rumpelstiltskin where the heroine has to uh, make straw into gold. And it's something that's seemingly impossible. And that's important to sort of like remember as it is that we we read this essay so that we can kind of like see where it is that she's making this uh, illusion within her title, but also within the essay itself. So. When I was living in an artist colony in the south of France, some fellow Latin Americans who taught at the university in um, a in Provence, I don't know, it's in French, I can't pronounce it. Uh, it's basically a French city about 10 miles north of the Mediterranean Sea, invited me to share a home-cooked meal with them. I had been living abroad almost a year, then on the NEA grant, which is the National Endowment for the Arts, a federal agency that funds artistic projects or of organizations and individuals. Uh, subsisting mainly on French bread and lentils so that my money could last longer. So when the invitation to dinner arrived, I accepted without hesitation, especially since they had promised Mexican food. What I didn't realize when they made this invitation was that I was supposed to be involved in preparing the meal. I guess they assumed I knew how to cook Mexican food because I am Mexican. They wanted specifically tortillas though I'd never, make a, I'd never made a tortilla in my life. It's true I had witnessed my mother rolling the little armies of dough into perfect circles, but my mother's family is from Gua, Juan, Juan, I cannot say it, Guanajuato? Sorry for butchering that. Um, it's a state in central Mexico, they are provincianos, country folk. They only know how to make flour tortillas. My father's family, on the other hand, is from Chilango, from Mexico City. Um, we ate corn tortilla, but we didn't make them. Someone was sent to the corner torter, tor, 
the Ria <laughs> to buy some. I never seen anybody make corn tortillas ever. Somehow my Latino host had gotten a hold of a packet of corn flour and this is what they tossed my way with orders to produce tortillas. Así como sea, any old way, they said and went back to their, their cooking. Why did I feel like the woman in the fairy tale who was locked in a room and ordered to spin straw into gold? I had the same sick feeling when I was required to write my critical essay for the MFA pro exam, which is the Masters of Fine Arts uh, academic degree. The only piece of non-creative writing necessary in order to get my graduate degree. How was I to start? There were rules involved here, unlike writing a poem or story, which I did intuitively. There was a step-by-step -step process needed, and I had better know it. I felt as if making tortillas of, or writing a critical paper for that matter were tasks so impossible I wanted to break down into tears. So it does mention the illusion right here, and this is where we're seeing that illusion about how that she feels um, like, why do I feel like the woman in the fairy tale that was ordered to spin straw into gold to make um, something out of like not really knowing like what to do with it exactly with with the, she's making that like comparison or that like um, that metaphor like between her and like having to uh, make the corn tortillas that she's never made before in her life similar to the girl that she had to uh, you know make the straw into gold and again just to sort of like uh, go over it just to recap what an illusion is an illusion is an indirect reference to a person a place an event or a literary work that the writer believes the readers will recognize so Cisneros uses a literary illusion in lines 20 to 21 to compare her challenge uh, making tortillas with that of a character in Rumpelstiltskin as you read the remainder of the essay consider the essay's title how does Cisneros carry the illusion through the essay and what is it greater meaning <clears throat> so yeah that's basically what i was talking about it's just making something like out of like not really what, knowing to do with it and the, in the end she says that it felt like uh something that should come naturally to her there, there were tasks so impossible that she wanted to break down into tears <clears throat> somehow though i managed to make tortillas cooked and burnt but edible nonetheless my hosts were absolutely ignorant when it came to Mexican food. They thought my tortillas were delicious. I'm glad my mama wasn't there. Thinking back and looking at an old photograph doc documenting the three of us consuming those lopsided circles, I am amazed. Just as I am amazed, I could finish my MFA exam. I've managed to do a lot of things in my life I didn't think I was capable of, and which many others didn't think I was capable of either especially because I am a woman, a Latina, an only daughter in a family of six men. My father would have liked to have seen me married long ago. In our culture, men and women don't leave their father's house except by way of marriage. I crossed my father's threshold with nothing carrying me but my own two feet, a woman whom no one came for and no one chased away. So in this, uh, paragraph we are really seeing like her her establishment of her culture her identity her race and her gender about her talking about being a mexican uh american woman about her being a latina and then also sort of the cultural expectations that arise from her being a latina woman um when it comes to like the the expectations that she didn't really meet from her family for her father that had just expected her to you know get married but for her to go and pursue something that was uh more independent and requiring her to think and uh to create and write that this was something that they didn't really like expect from her but that she did it anyways <clears throat> To make matters worse, I left before any of my six brothers had ventured away from home. I broke a terrible taboo. Somehow, looking back at photos of myself as a child, I wonder if I was aware of having begun already my own quiet war. And this is breaking tradition. That's just more or less what I was writing there. And this is where we're seeing that um, her like embodying this, this idea that she has within her title of her, uh, the metamorphosis that she's going through, this uh, change this transformation of weaving straw into gold, of doing uh, the seemingly impossible, of doing things that uh, despite everything, all of the odds stacked against her, of her being a Latina woman, that she was able to come out of that and do things that people never expected her to do. <clears throat> I like to think that somehow my family, my Mexicanness, my poverty, all have something to do with shaping me into a writer. 
I like to think my parents were preparing me all along for my life as an artist, even though they didn't know it. From my father, I inherited a love of wandering. He was born in Mexico City, but as a young man, he traveled into the U.S. vagabonding. He eventually was drafted and thus became a citizen. Some of the stories he has told me about his first months and um, in the U.S. with little or no English surface in my stories in the house on Mango Street, as well as others I've had in mind, I have had in mind to write in the future. From him, I inherited a sappy heart. He still cries when he watches Mexican soaps, especially if they deal with children who have forsa forsaken their parents. <laughs> My mother was born like me, in Chicago, but of Mexican descent. It would be her tough streetwise voice that would haunt all my stories and poems. An amazing woman who loves to draw and read books and can sing an opera, a smart cookie. And you'll notice that I did make some like uh, tiny like annotations on the side, nothing, because this this isn't really like requiring that much like in depth analysis. I just do it so that when it is that if I come back to the text that I look and I can know, oh, that this this paragraph is about her mother, this paragraph is about her home. This one's about her brothers. This one's about her teachers, her childhood, her creativity. So it's more or less like you can do this also when it's like stuff that doesn't really require that deep thinking analysis. But when it is that we get to more advanced texts that have like deeper uh, meanings, that is when it's like important to sort of make notes to sort of like uh, try to get to the, the understanding of the text itself. Um, which again, these are just suggestions for you all when it is that you go to college eventually. <clears throat> so... When I was a little girl, we traveled to Mexico City so much, I thought my grandparents' house on uh, La Fortuna, number 12, was home. It was the only constant in our nomadic ramblings from sh uh, one Chicago flat to another. The house on Destiny Street, number 12, in the Colonia Tepe Tepeyac, would be perhaps the only home I knew. And that nostalgia for a home would be a theme that would obsess me. Um, so her sort of like wanting to have like a place called home and uh, that only being in uh, Mexico City with her her grandparents house that that was the, sort of the only constant that was like present in her life throughout her her lifetime. My brothers also uh, figured greatly in my art, especially my the older two. I grew up in their shadow. Henry, the second oldest and my favorite, appears often in poems I have written and in stories which at times only borrow his nickname, Kiki. He played a major role in my childhood. We were bunk bedmates. We were co-conspirators. We were pa we were pals. Until my oldest brother came back from studying in Mexico and let left me odd woman out for always. What would my teachers say if they knew I was a writer now? Who would have guessed it? I wasn't a very bright student. I didn't much like school because we moved so much and I was always new new and funny looking. In my fifth grade report card, I have nothing but an avalanche of C's and D's, but I don't remember being that stupid. I was good at art and I read plenty of library books and Kiki laughed at all my jokes. At home, I was fine, but at school, I never opened my mouth except when the teacher called on me. When I think of how I see myself, it would have... It would have to be at age 11. I know I'm 32 on the outside, but inside I'm 11. I'm the girl in the picture with skinny arms and a crumpled skirt and crooked hair. I didn't like school because all they saw was the outside me. School was lots of rules and sitting with your hands folded and being very afraid all the time. I liked looking out the window and thinking and thinking. I liked staring at the girl across the way, writing her name over and over again in red ink. I wondered why the boy with the dirty collar in front of me didn't have a mama who took better care of him. I think my mama and my and papa did the best they could to keep us warm and clean and clean and never hungry. We had birthday and graduation parties and things like that. But there was another hunger that they that had to be fed. There was a hunger I didn't even have a name for. Was this when I began writing? And I think that this hunger that she's talking about is this hunger for creativity, for her to be able to uh, make things and create. And um, one thing that also sort of like stands out to me is that when it is that she's talking about uh, looking back in, in her, her childhood, about talking about the teachers and her brothers and all of this stuff, that this all has to do with like people that, that never really like expected much from her, I guess. Um, 
<clears throat> well, her brothers did. It says that they uh, figured greatly in her art, but I think when it came to them, like growing up, that they didn't really think that she would make this uh, much out of herself. I guess as she has now, as a uh, world-renowned like uh, Mexican American author, and also when it talks about her like reflecting on her childhood, about her like that even though that on the outside she's thirty-two, inside she's eleven. That uh, she looks back to this time. Um, and when it was that she was sort of, it, it, what it is, is that she's basically saying that she was like a, like a dreamer, that she didn't like sort of like the rule and organization that school had, that she was also looking out the window. She was looking at uh, people. She was admiring things and um, just looking at like anything that was like ordinary. She was just like sort of an observer. And maybe these things became uh, inspirations for her writing because it is that this, even though that her herself never like experienced extreme poverty and that um like as she mentions right there about how her, her parents would take care of her but then her noticing that there were other kids that weren't I guess as uh like lucky as her about her seeing that one boy with the dirty collar and like wondering why his parents weren't taking better care of him that this was very much that she grew up around poverty and that she grew up around uh this sort of like treatment that uh, a lot it's very common in a lot of like Mexican American households. So this is where a lot of like the inspirations for her writing or for her stories uh, come from is that that she was the observer and that she became uh, used them for her creativity. And uh, this is where we see a lot of this with for reflected within her stories, which is again, very common within the Mexican American experience. So in 1966, we moved into a house, a real one, our first real home. This meant we didn't have to change schools and be the new kids on the block every couple of years. We could make friends and not be afraid we'd have to say goodbye to them and start all over. My brother and the flock of boys they brought home would become important characters eventually for my stories. Louis and his cousins Meme Ortiz and his dog with two names, one in English and one in Spanish. My mother flour flourished in her own home. She took bo books out of the library and taught herself to garden. To grow flowers so envied, we had to put a lock <clears throat> on the gate to keep out the midnight flower thieves. My mother has never quit gardening. And this is when it when it when it when I was reading this, it kind of reminded me a little bit of Walkers in Search of Our Mother's ga Gardens. And this has to do with creating about how she was talking about that. Um, you know, that there is sort of like this creativity that, that women have. And even though this is even reflected within her own mother about her gardening that this is sort of her own like way of being creative and the way that she uh, can admire her gardens as well. So this is where I found sort of like that interesting connection. We can all, always find these overlapping ideas that are present within text. So I, it was really like um, interesting to me that I found that and I was able to make that connection between both of those texts. This was the period in my life, that slippery age when you are both child and woman and neither. I was to record in the house on Mango Street. I was still shy. I was a girl who couldn't come out of her shell. How was I to know I would be recording and documenting the women who sat their sadness on an elbow and stared out a window? Um, again, sort of like speaking for the women for, for creativity. And this is also where I feel like that connects to that reading about In Search of Our Mother's Gardens. It would be the city streets of Chicago I would later rec record as seen through a child's eyes. I've done all kinds of things I didn't think I could do since then. I've gone to a prestigious university, studied with famous writers, and taken a master's of fine arts degree. I've taught poetry in schools in Illinois and Texas. I've gotten an NEA grant and run away with it as far as my cor courage would take me. I've seen the bleached and blitter mountains of the Peloponnesus which is a um, peninsula forming, forming in the southern part of mainland Greece. I've lived on an island. I've been to Venice twice. I've lived in Yugoslavia. I've been to the famous Nice flower market behind the opera house. I've lived in a village in the pre-Alps and witnessed the daily parade of uh, prom promenaders. So these are all like sort of her accomplishments that she's made within life, because considering all of this of her being uh, coming from her being that that shy and timid um girl that was like not that uh has hadn't broken out of her shell yet that um through her writings through her being an author that she was able to obtain all of these things that she went on and furthered her education that she went to all of these different things and she's done all of this different stuff with her life that you know like I was saying 
all of the odds were stacked against her. And despite this, she pulled through and that she was able to really make something of herself. Uh, I've moved since Europe to the strange and wonderful country of Texas, land of Polaroid blue skies and big bugs. I met a mayor with my last name. I met famous Chicana and Chicano artists and writers and politicos, which is um, Spanish politicians. Texas is another chapter in my life. It brought with it the Dobby Paisano uh, Fellowship, which is a prestigious award authored Offer to authors who are uh, from or write about Texas. It includes cash as well as the use of living quarters. A six-month residency on a 265-acre ranch. But most important, Texas brought Mexico back to me. In the days when I would sit at my favorite people watching spot, the snaky Woolworths uh, counter across the street from the Alamo, the Woolworths, um, which has since been torn down to make way for progress, I couldn't think of anything else I'd rather be than a writer. I've traveled and lectured from Cape Cod to San Francisco, to Spain, Yugoslavia, Greece, Mexico, France, Italy, and now today to Texas. Along the way, there has been straw for the taking. With a little imagination, it can be spun into gold. So like, that's what I was talking about. It's making something from nothing, transforming life when the odds are stacked against you and, uh, you know, really using that and that how it talks about that her writing is her magic. Writing is her magic. This is what has gotten her uh, to where she is today, that she spun the straw into gold, that she's made something great out of the ordinary, that she has transformed her life even though that everything was against her from the beginning of her being a uh, Latin American or Latina woman. So um, that's pretty much the, the reading itself. Again, I'm, I'm going to post probably these, these questions in Google Classroom if you already did them. And um, what other people are doing, if you don't like the Google Forms or you're having issues with it, you can also maybe just make it into like a Google Doc and then share that with me. Or um, you can also just, if, if you did it on the paper, just uh, take pictures of the paper and then uh, email me the pictures or upload it through the Google Classroom Dropbox. Whatever it is that works for you, that's a uh, best way to uh, submit the assignment for those extra credit points. Um, yeah, that, that I'll be good with any of them. So yeah, if you have any questions, just email me and that's pretty much it.